everybody, Scout Crafty here again. It's Monday, Mishmash Monday. I hope you had a great weekend. Uh, you know, I was thinking, um, an old timer once told me years ago that uh, said, you know, everybody is great at something. And uh, this was nice to hear when you're a youngster, but uh, you know, you say, well, what do you mean everybody's great? He says, you know, a lot of people never in their life will find out what they're great at because they don't try enough things. And uh, I always remember that. And you know something, uh, when you go into the military, they give you this, uh, it's called an ASVAB test, uh, Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery. Or something. It's, a, it's a test that they determine what you're good at from uh, different, you know, uh, subjects. You could be a gearhead, somebody that's uh, drawn towards mechanics and not even know it. And this test will uh, find out. So, but unfortunately, a lot of us never get to have these opportunities, you know, and and I have gone through life and found people that the people you would not think are good at certain jobs are fantastic. I've seen uh, people that you go to the range, the shooting range, and you say, you know, wow, you know, look at that woman over there. She's such a fantastic shot. And she just, you know, it took to it. People take to certain things, but you never know how good you're going to be at something because we don't have the opportunity to try everything. Um, if you're a, a parent or somebody that's a, you know has some influence over a young person, it's always good to try and challenge them with different tasks, and that's what I want to talk about first. Uh, you know, my dad, a lot of times, things would happen in the house, and my father would give me certain jobs. Now, to do. I used to think he used to give me these jobs to do just to keep me busy and keep me out of his hair, but I'm sure there was a deeper intelligence to him doing that, you know, and saying. He would build confidence in me by, you know, giving me simple tasks to do and, and figure it out. And and I'll tell you something, it's it really does work. And and that's what our first project is today. It's a simple uh a broken toilet paper rod that goes uh you've seen them in it before, you know, that holds the roll of toilet paper in between, you know, uh your toilet paper holder. And uh, this one happened to break, and, and I was thinking, of, I was, you know, uh, you can pick them up for a buck in any dollar store, but I said, you know, this would be something my dad would say, look, I want you to fix this, I want you to make this better than when it came from the factory, and, and you know, that's a challenge. I said, let's challenge ourselves today and take a Here look at Here's today's this. project in question. As you can see, this is a simple toilet paper roll holder. And, uh, you know, it, it goes in there. It has a little spring in there. These, it, the original one, I'm sure, was wood. That probably broke 40 years ago. This one's got to be 35 years old. It looks like it's made from a PVC polyvinyl chloride. Uh, you can see what happened here. Over the years, this end broke off. And one end has a circular uh, receptacle, and the other end has a, a rectangular receptacle. And that's so that when you put this in here, that this doesn't spin, but just stays steady, and then the roll will spin around it. So, uh, what we have to do is try and fix this. And I'll think about that for a second. Look at this and say, how would you do it? How would you fix this area? This one has to have the rectangular section. Um, how would you fix it that uh, that it would be better than new, but still, you know? something you could do it in your show it's the small projects like this that let you get downstairs and work on your machines and you know justify the fact of owning these machines and sometimes like you know i said we i haven't used a milling machine in a while i'd like to get that running let's see if we can use the mill and uh let me show you what we have as far as uh, material okay, we're going to be using this uh, nice piece of delrin i love working with delrin it's so much fun and this is almost the exact same size as this piece here so Let's do this real quick and easy. I have an idea of how I want to do it. Uh, you can see here we got two little hairline cracks here. Let's cut this piece off here. We'll cut this off and then we'll uh, make an insert here, square off the end. Tell me what you now, think. Now the first thing we want to do is we cut off a small piece of Delrin that we're going to be working with. And um, whenever you work, you want to square off the one end. And I'll tell you, we have to square off the, the both ends, but we want to do one end at a time. And because there's so much overhang, when you have this much hanging outside the end of the lathe, that's one of the things nice about having a bigger lathe, that you could slip this down into the chuck. My uh, through hole does isn't big enough for this to slip through so i have to only go as far as here i can only get like a three quarters of an inch grip on here so we're going to turn it quickly and we're going to just take off a little bit of the edge and square to make that nice and square
Now, once you have one side nice and squished, see that? See how nice del ring? Look at that. What a beautiful material this is to work with. Once one side is nice and square like this, you could place this in here, press it against the back of the chuck here, and you know that you're going to have a nice steady watch. When we turn this on, it won't... Uh, see that? It's nice and smooth and straight. We're going to now trim off this side. Now, the last thing we're going to do is we're going to put a little dimple in the end of that... Uh, rod. And I'll show you why we do that later. I'm going to just put... There we go. Just a little dimple. I'll show okay, you. Okay, here we have our two straight cut sides. And remember that little dimple and why we did now, that. Now, the later. reason we put that little dimple in the back here is so that we can put a live center here. Because remember, we have this much hanging out from the chuck. And uh, this way, we want this to be very rigid. So by doing that, you could see... Now we can support it at the end. Again, it's almost like turning between two centers, but now we're just going to put a little line here where we want our square to end. Now, using Randy's awesome scribe, Randy Richard in the shop, he makes these wonderful scribes. Look, he engraved it. Oh, fantastic. Anyway, using this scribe, super sharp, I was able to scribe out basically where we want this is uh, what we want it to be. We took the measurements from looking at the ruler, and now we're going to go over to the milling we're machine. At the milling machine, let me show you the setup here. Now, you try not to take this big vise off. Whenever you can, you want to leave this kind of stationary because it takes a while to make sure it's accurate. So I leave that in, and then I just put a secondary vise in that vise so I can hold the work this way. And I'll show you why I want to do that. So let me uh, get on the now, tripod. Now, can you see the scribe marks there? Basically, what we want to use is a milling bit, and we're going to take off the top and the sides. Now, if this was, if we were using aluminum or something, we wouldn't have this kind of setup. But being this is Delrin, it cuts so easy. Even the overhang, I would have this closer to the vise. But you're going to see how easy this cuts. Now, can you see the scribe marks there and how we're just going to work our way down? And then we're going to flip it and then do all four sides and uh, get down to that squared off section. Okay, here's where we're at. Now, we did cut off, like I said, that tip. And uh, this is where we want this to insert into here. We don't want this whole piece to insert, but, uh, you know, at least an inch or so. We'll give it a lot of strength. And we're going to have to cut off a little bit of this. You can see how that came out, right? Real nice. We're going to have to cut off just a, about half of that. And uh, and we do that on okay, the lathe. Now, we want to turn that down to the, the inside diameter of this uh, tube. So here's what you can do. This is an easy way, an old-fashioned way of doing it. You take a pair of... Uh, these are inside calipers. And you go in here and you just open it up so that just get a slip fit in here. And then you take a pair of outside calipers and you match it up to here. You can see here we have it matched up. Now when you turn it on the lathe, you could just, when you get to this point, it'll be very close. Okay, you could see our outside calipers here pass over it. Just, you know, touching it lightly, passing it over. And you can see here's the inside cap. And you can see that fits on. Again, now we can we can take off a thousand or two and not have to worry about going too deep. Now, because we took the time out to get this dimension correct, the rest is cake. Because now all we got to do is turn this part up to that line there. We got to turn this to that dimension. So we could just keep feeding this in until we just do a skim touch till we touch it. And that will be the exact dimension all the way to here. So that's why we did that. This is really can be waste. We don't have to put that in there. So we'll cut it down now. Now, something I always found interesting on a metal lathe, you see that rotating rod there, that threaded rod, that's called a carriage feed. And what that does, when you engage, there's a half nut, when you engage that, that will power feed the carriage towards the, the uh, chuck or away from the chuck, depending on how you have it set up. But it, it automatically feeds it and it gives you a very nice finish because it feeds it at a perfect rate. And you can see here the finish, it's a beautiful finish and we don't have a, a perfect uh cutter in there but you can see uh, what a nice job it does and it's really uh, a joy to use the automatic carriage feed when you set it up correctly 
you just engage it and then you just watch the carriage take off a uh, predetermined amount. Okay, we have a very nice fit. Listen, that's a very nice fit. And we'll put a little bit of epoxy in there. But uh, you can see how it now we just got to cut off the top here, chamfer the edges, and Bob's and your uncle. Our finished product. You could see here we chamfered the edges here. So that'll slip in nice, put a nice chamfer around here. And we CA it with thick CA. And this should last for another 40, 50 years, right? I know what you're thinking. You're saying, did I just watch 10 minutes of a guy fixing a toilet paper roll rod? <laughs> Unfortunately, yes, you did. But I have some redeeming uh, uh, subjects to talk about now. Uh, a friend of the show by the name of John Possum, he was asking me about uh, what do I think about the uh, Knipex slip joint plies compared to channel locks, things like that. I wanted to talk a little bit about gimmick tools. You know, I've always liked gimmick tools. Let's dive into some gimmick tools. John was asking about uh, what my thoughts were with something like the traditional slip joint pliers like this. These are the channel locks. It's a model 430. And uh, this here is a, a Knipex. Now, the difference is that, you know, I don't have the proper jaws, but they, they have this as the new system that they use. It's a push button system that slides up and down like this and will lock in. Now, the pros to this is that there's so many different positions that you can go into. Another pro is that it's a split handle design like this, where this is a side by side. But uh, one thing I always say is it's very hard to compare pliers like these, even if they had the same jaw head. I'm talking about the mechanism or whatever, because of the price uh, system. This is uh, just over $15 at Amazon. This one here is uh, just under $35. So you, it's not even in the same ballpark as far as price goes. But again, for some of us that, you know, it's not price, you just want a good tool or something like that. Uh, this one here... A lot of people swear by this system here because it's uh, it has so many different positions on here. You can see the gears in there. Compared to this, this one only has, I believe, uh, seven or eight uh, positions that you can see. Seven or eight that you can go into. But, you know, people that have been using these for a long time, you, you learn how to live around the different tool. But um, I always say I'm, I'm a uh, what they call recreational user, so I can use anything because I don't use. But if you're a mechanic and use use this every day, you don't, money is no option. You want the best one you can get and the one that's going to make your job easy. I'm a big fan of national tool and hardware shows. And whenever I can get a chance, I always try and go. And that's where you see all the new tools being made and manufacturers coming out with things. And they demonstrate it. You get to play with them, touch them, see what, you know, Milwaukee's always there at a lot of, of these shows. And and uh, DeWalt and all these other, but also, you know, a lot of hand tool manufacturers. So I used to go to quite a few and I, and I really enjoy them. But uh, like I said, I do like gimmicky tools, not because I think they're better, just because I always enjoy playing with them. So let me show you a couple here. Now, years back, there was a company called Lockjaw. I don't know if you ever heard of them before. Uh, and it, this is their, you know, they were doing a lot of info commercials, things like that, Lockjaw. And uh, I think they, they might still be in business. I don't even know if they're still in business or not, but uh, you don't see too much of this anymore being talked about. But they came out with a, uh, a line of self-locking tools. Now, anybody that knows, especially for, uh, they first came out with like these type of the slip joint type, and then they came out with the uh, the vice grip type. And, and what it does, it eliminates you having to adjust it. Now, by for hand. those of you unfamiliar with how to adjust, if if you have a regular, this is a regular old fashioned vice grip. But if I wanted to close it onto here, I would have to uh, loosen this up until I got to a point like here, just about here, and then squeeze it down and that would lock it down and then if i wanted to go into a different size of wood like this i would have to readjust it again until i got to this point and then lock it down so uh the claim to fame with these tools was that when you came up to a piece of uh uh, hardware or something that you wanted to clamp onto all you would do is you would put it in here squeeze it down and it would automatically lock on there. And you can increase or decrease the tension on how tight you want it to lock on. But it would lock on like it locked on that one, and then you release it, and then if I wanted to lock on this piece here, it'd be the same thing, and it would lock on like that. Again, without any adjustment whatsoever. So, um, is it a gimmick? Kind of. Is it new? Absolutely not. They were making these years ago. Here's an old one made in the USA, same exact principle. And uh, so these have been around for years, but 
a lock jaw is kind of a, a newer now, company. to increase or decrease the locking pressure, there's a little set screw here. You see that knurled screw right here? And what you would do, it actually goes against what you would normally think. You would loosen it up to increase the jaw pressure. So here, I loosened it up a little bit, and now watch the jaw pressure I'll get off here. See, as and it's a little bit harder than it was before. If I want it harder than that, I loosen it up some more. Couple more turns on here, try it again. And there we go, it's a much harder grip. So, and you could do that all the way until, but that's basically, and no matter what I grip on, it'll give the same amount of pressure depending on the size. Now, uh, they have different uh, models here. Here I am closing again. They have the, uh, this is like a welding type clamp here. You can see how these work. Again, if you wanted to uh, clamp down something like this, it works the same way automatic no matter what size you uh you use it on big small uh it gives you the same amount of pressure so again gimmicky absolutely is it fun now oh yeah. these lock jaw slip joint are uh, basically the same thing and how these are supposed to work there's a spring here that when you close it onto something like here this piece of wood it will drop down until it gets to a point here and then this will swivel into the catch and that's it that you see how you, you're locked in there you got a tight grip so it'll itself adjust for depending on the size now i'll go with a bigger piece here here's a bigger piece right much bigger and watch what happens this will slip down and then it'll when it gets to a certain point it locks and then you get a good grip now you would say wow that's pretty good you don't ever have to adjust it let me tell you the cons of all of these. Now, when blinds. you go to the show, they got little fixtures set up, and everybody's playing with it. Go, man, these are these are cool. They work good and everything. But let me tell you something. I don't care you what kind of guarantee they give you and everything. Let me show you one thing. You see this here? I've had this. I bought this when I was like 16 years old, and this thing still operates and works exactly the same as the day I bought. I mean, this thing is fantastic, right? Minimal moving parts, okay? It's only got like six moving, seven moving parts. This thing here, the problem with this is you have all these parts, okay? You have springs, you have pins. We all know what problem pins can be after a while, right? Uh, we have pins. We have, And this, this is a uh, material here that doesn't, it feels almost like a... I don't know. I don't even know if it's a, a plastic or something. It doesn't even feel like a good quality steel. Look at all the springs and different contraptions that you have here. This is just a, a problem waiting to happen. And obviously it's true because like I said, these never really took off because they don't, they have a failure rate. Uh, like for example here, this is almost brand new, but this one here doesn't work like it's supposed to when you try and lock it up. It sometimes jams up. Look at all the springs and the swivel joints and it's just too many parts. When you're dealing with tools, the one thing I've learned is you want to use the KISS rule. You remember the KISS rule? No, not these guys. This rule here. Now I know what you're thinking. Look, it locks up here, right? Nice and tight. Loosen up. Grab this one. Same thing. Locks up nice and tight. Loosen it up. Grab this one. Here we have four different sizes I'm dealing with and not one adjustment, right? You're thinking that's fantastic. I mean, why would you want to go with the other? Because believe me, in three years, this thing will be missing something. So in closing, I guess uh, you could say I'm kind of old fashioned when it comes to tools. I mean, if uh, something's been around for a hundred years, you know, it's a proven tool and it'll uh, last. And, and, you know, it's, uh, there's a reason that they remake it and it's a good tool, but you know, you get these fly by night companies, fly by night tools. And when they offer these lifetime warranties, that's a joke, huh? You know, just send $14 for shipping to cover shipping. You're buying a new tool, you know? <laughs> anyway, thanks very much for tuning in. Hope you have a great day. Take care now. Bye-bye.